Jesus is the true and better Adam who passed the test of obedience in the garden and whose righteousness is imputed to us. Jesus is the true and better Abel, though innocently slain, his blood of righteousness cries out for our acquittal, not condemnation. Jesus is the true and better Abraham who answered the call of God to leave the comfortable and to go out into the void, not knowing where he went to create a new people of God. Jesus is the true and better Isaac who wasn't just offered up on the mount by his father, but was truly sacrificed for us all. Jesus is the true and better Jacob who wrestled with God and who took the blow of justice for us all so that we, like Jacob, would only receive the wounds of discipline and grace. Jesus is the true and better Joseph who, at the right hand of the king, forgives those who betrayed him and sold him and uses his new power to save them. Jesus is the true and better Moses who stands in the gap between his people and God and who mediates a new covenant between them. Jesus is the true and better rock of Moses, who, struck with the rod of God's justice, now gives us water in the desert. Jesus is the true and better Job, the truly innocent sufferer, who then intercedes for and saves his stupid friends. Jesus is the true and better David whose victory becomes the people's victory even though they didn't lift a stone to accomplish it. Jesus is the true and better Jonah who was cast out into the storm so that we could be brought in. Jesus is the true and better Esther who didn't just risk his life but gave his life to save his people. Did you know that the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ was prophesied and foreshadowed all the way back in Genesis 3? Adam and Eve sinned by eating the forbidden fruit and suddenly their eyes were opened and they realized they were naked. This represents spiritual nakedness as well. So before God banished them, he killed an animal, made some clothing from its skin, and covered their shame and nakedness. In the same way, Jesus was slain so he could cover our spiritual nakedness. God showed Adam and Eve that sin has consequences. Now this animal could have been a lamb, thereby presenting a prophetic picture of Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. And so this could have demonstrated from the beginning the type of substitutionary atonement that Jesus would do on our behalf. And God is the same yesterday and today and forever. Is the earth old or is the earth young? Here's the question for you. When God formed Adam, how old do you think he appeared to be? Most people think he was formed as a man, so maybe 30 years old or so. It doesn't say that he was ever a baby. He clearly wasn't formed in the womb of a woman. It says that God formed him and then put him right to work in the Garden of Eden. So it appears that he was at least a teenager, if not a young man. But the fact is that he was born yesterday literally yesterday, but he appears to be 30 years old. Wait, so God can create things in adulthood that are actually just a newborn? So a rock that we think is millions of years old because all the science tests claim that, could it be that that rock was actually created younger than what it appears to be? Adam is referred to as the first Adam and Jesus Christ as the last Adam. Adam was made a living soul and Jesus was made a quickening spirit. Adam was natural and Jesus Christ was spiritual. Adam's origin was of the earth and Jesus's origin was of heaven. Mankind reflects the image of Adam, but saved men following after Christ reflect the image and likeness of Jesus. We are all made dead in Adam, but when we put our faith in Christ, we are made alive in Jesus. Adam is the head of the old creation and Jesus is the head of the new creation. Both Adam and Jesus were the representative man who acted on behalf of the whole human race. Both performed one act that had tremendous consequences for all of mankind. Adam disobeyed by eating the fruit that hung on a tree. Jesus obeyed by being the fruit that hung on a tree. Adam's act produced judgment and death. Jesus' act produced righteousness and life. Notice how when the bride of Adam sinned, Adam placed all the blame on her. But when the bride of Christ sinned, Jesus took her blame upon himself. This is a picture of how marriage ought to be. Galatians 6.2 says to carry each other's burdens and in this way fulfill the law of Christ. The bride of Christ, aka us, was supposed to justly be punished for our sins. But Jesus, 
the perfect husband in covenant with his bride said no put her sins on me yet how many marriages today are like adam when he said the woman you put here with me she gave me some fruit and i ate it it's her fault she did this to me blame her yet we never once see jesus when he's going to the cross say it's her fault she did this to me i wouldn't be being beaten and mocked and crucified if it wasn't for her so what would marriages and relationships look like if we started taking on other people's burdens as our own Jesus would rather go to the cross than live in eternity without his bride. Adam died so his wife could be born. Now hear me out. The term deep sleep has been a metaphorical term for death. And Jesus often referred to dead people as asleep. Being in a deep sleep can be translated to a symbolic type of death. So in essence, Adam was put to death so that his wife could be formed from his rib bone. She then became bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Adam laid down his life to give his wife newborn life. Jesus did the same thing. Jesus is the bridegroom that laid down his life on the cross so that his wife, his bride, could be born again. And as the book of Revelation states, we are now one with Christ, awaiting the marriage supper of the Lamb, the consummation of the bridegroom and his bride. Jesus fed the 5,000, but they all deserted him when he gave them the spiritual meaning of the bread. Twelve disciples stayed with him, but only three went further with him into the Garden of Gethsemane. And out of those three, only one was with him when he died on the cross. And no one was waiting for him to walk out of the tomb. The closer you get to your cross, the smaller your crowd becomes. Everyone wants free handouts to make their life easier, but as soon as you hold them accountable to walk in the truth, they're gone. You know who your true friends are by those who stick with you through the hard times. Many people want the things that Jesus can give them, but how many actually just want Jesus? Many want the promised land, but how many just want God's presence? So even if this world strips everything away from you, will you still seek Jesus. When Paul said, study to show yourself approved, but the New Testament hadn't even been written yet, then what was he referring to? If the Old Testament Sabbath passed away with the law, then why did the disciples and Paul continue to keep the Sabbath throughout the whole book of Acts after the resurrection of Jesus Christ? And why will God's people continue to keep the Sabbath during the future millennial reign? Is there significance to Judas eating the bread of Christ at the same moment that Satan entered him. Since Judas confessed his sin and returned the money, is Judas in heaven? Or was Judas destined to destruction from the beginning of time? Is there deeper meaning to Judas's kiss of betrayal? What does Satan entering Judas look like at a physical level? Why did Jesus put Judas in charge of the money knowing he was a thief? Why did Jesus choose Judas knowing he was a devil?